to me, music is one of the more elusive aspects of modern life. Um, it's ubiquitous. It, it exists in the form of everything from iTunes to MP3s to dot .move files to whatever. But above all, for me as an artist, as a writer, as a musician, music really isn't music. It's information. And I'm very much interested in data aesthetics as one of the main ways to get people to start thinking about how do we inframe some of the radical changes going on in modern life. Um, like I was saying earlier, um, a little while ago I went to both the north, uh, the ar far Arctic North Pole, and you can see behind me, this is off of, um, I, I went to um, several of the main glacier fields and did a series of high definition portraits of the ice. Um, this is meant to mimic Caspar David Friedrich's uh, famous painting. Um, hold on one second, I'll just have to sync. Uh, sorry, I'm sending myself a message here. There we go. And, yeah. So, when you look at what he was doing with the modern Romanticist movement in 1818, um, you can see what ends up happening is people like Mary Shelley, uh, Percy Shelley, everybody was trying to figure out nature in the 19th century. So the Romantic movement in painting um, really set the tone for composition, and composition was reflective of many of the developments in the arts. So if you compare that to, like I was saying earlier, what I was doing, I was kind of going for these series of photo portraits of, of radical different geographies and going between there and looking at these kinds of, these are high definition portraits of ice. Um, so these are huge ice boulders. And one of the things that struck me when I was there was the kind of dematerialization that was going on of the landscape. When I say dematerialization, I'm talking about melting, I'm talking about transforming, I'm talking about vanishing. Um, and I'll show you one of my favorite portraits from that trip was this one where I kind of wanted to look like an old painting. Um, so these are high definition photographs that are gonna be touring um, in a couple different museums. So what I ended up doing was chartering a 100-year-old icebreaker. You can see that. The idea was, like, we I went on the ship. I took a studio, um, and we were on the ship for five weeks circling the North Pole and the, the high Arctic circles. Um, but when you say you took a studio, what does that mean? Well, a studio basically is digital media material, high-definition cameras, a mm -hmm. um, couple terabyte hard drives to record all my film and my footage, and um, a laptop to help document my music notation. Does it include people? To yeah, people are part of a studio, yeah. It's like, um, in architecture, like a studio is a group of people, usually. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. it's not just a physical place. Like, the studio, Mitchell, Joachim is not just Mitchell. It's probably you open a door and there's a whole bunch of desks and there's people in that room. You know? 14 of my love slaves. Yeah. <laughs> so, for me, as, as an artist, um, I got mostly well known for music, which is a kind of a drag, and I've been trying to re correct that ever since. So um, my first gallery shows in New York were with Jeffrey Deitch and Anita Nose. Uh, they're both very important galleries for New York. And then my most recent shows are with Robert Miller Gallery. I've had shows at the Louvre Museum, at the Guggenheim, at, the, at MoMA. Um, and so what ends up happening, I keep noticing, is that even though I'm doing visual material, people always reprioritize sound. So in the last two years, I've been doing these kind of what I call acoustic portraits and trying to figure out how to get people out of thinking about that kind of psychological box. <coughs> and um, so with uh, these couple of projects I'm going to show you, I want them to be reflections off of what Mitchell was talking about because we're looking at a kind of dialogue, a dialectical tension between landscape and composition. But data aesthetics is the kind of glue. So what I want to do is show you a mathematical portrait of the ice of Antarctica taken from uh, NASA's Goddard Space Center. And I'm going to play it silently. And it's a data composite of ice um, that has been uh, composited of a statistical analysis of the ice um, transforming over a period of time condensed into one mathematical landscape. Um, for my Terra Nova project, what I did was synthesize the sound of ice and look at this idea of a vanishing place. So check this out silently and then I'm going to play it with music. So you get a flyover. All the ice you're seeing, these are statistical models of the ice that satellites have taken over a period of time and given a kind of a, a statistical mean of the ice. And. Um, I enjoy thinking about this idea of topologies and moving through the data landscape in a way that um, I'd say there's a kind of 
a, a beautiful phenomenology of information going on here. But again, you're seeing thermals, you can see the kind of land, but all done in this kind of mathematics of rendered to uh, topologies. Um, now, let's see how this sounds with um, so one of the string quartet works that I've been working on. Um, and there's a project called Arctic Rhythms I've been focusing on, so let's play. This is the sound of ice. Um, it's, you're hearing a hexagonal mathematics. Remember we were talking about earlier. Um, so the Book of Ice, there's two parts of it. One is Antarctica, the other is uh, the Arctic Circle. Um, and this is going to be a free release from my website when the book comes out. And it's going to be statistical analysis of ice. Um, so um, ice and snowflakes, again, um, hexagonal structure. I'll show you some of that. But let's play with that data landscape and do an associative mix here. I'm going to play a sound, and you're going to hear an image that you just heard. And I kind of want you to think about how we think of mixing in general. Some of you all who are involved with sound, you can change the feeling of an image, an acoustic ecology, so to speak, with different sounds. So if I play the same image with a different soundtrack, you can continuously try and edit and get a sort of visual rhythm going. Um, so the rhythm of the ice, the, these are sort of pattern recognitions. So um, I did several variations of the same theme. You just listen for the pattern for a moment. Now let's take that same sound patch and do... So what you're hearing there is again a hexagonal, you know, six-sided structure transformed into a mathematical equation. Mathematical equation is played into sonification software, max MSP patch, and then the output, you can change that tone, whatever, I could change it to piano sound, I could change it to drum beats. Once you have the MIDI file of that, you're good to go. So I took, you can see all these different uh, rhythm patterns that I've done, and I'm going to play you one of the inspirations for the project, which is called judo, which means the play of water, and that's from Ravel, who's an impressionist composer. So just check this out for a second. So what I want you guys to think about is, again, the role of the composer, the relationship to an image, sound plus image, what ends up happening when you're looking at these kinds of synthesis of forms. Um, music is patterns, symmetries, uh, asymmetries, looking at ruptures in time, uh, tempo, polyrhythm, uh, polytonality. Um, so let's go back to that one image, and I'm going to play the same image with this uh, hexagonal al um, algorithm. Yeah, they're going to be free downloads when the book comes out. Okay. I, can, I mean, I can give it to you on a memory stick. If I you would want. love them. Sure. No. They're, they're all the basic mathematical analysis of ice, but put into this different tone patches. Like, yeah, they're really amazing. So, um, in fact, uh, yeah, when um, I'll, I can give you this, these, when I finish? Yeah. Cool. Two seconds. sound at the same time. That is a pain in the ass. Oh, you know what I can do? There we go. And Arctic Rhythms comes back up. But um, I, I'm very interested in a kind of cross synthesis.
So <clears throat> you can kind of see how people can kind of <laughs> how people can generate tones, but also look at the synthesis of forms that any composer, especially in a visual era like ours, is going to have to face. So when you're thinking about experiential uh, situations, um, that it goes straight back to what those two economists, Pine and Gilmore, were talking about earlier that I've called the experience economy. Um, so what I want to do is play you um, some earlier material. Actually, before I do that, let me just show one quick image here of um, applying uh, different kinds of compositional strategy to the way people think of video. Hold on, take a second. There we go. So from, this is something I'm probably going to end up playing later. So you have to excuse me if um, there's going to be repetition on my eventual evening, but I think it's an important video to show. So this is from 1901. It's considered one of the first videos of showing visual sampling. En 1900, il y a donc presque 100 ans, Méliès représente ce qu'il était réellement dans la vie, un homme orchestre. So that's from 1900, and it's called One Man Band, Homme Orchestre, if you speak French. So what I love about that is the, it, the implication is that he's doing a choreography with himself. He has to project it, record it, dance with the image, edit it again, because there's a visual rhythm he has to be aware of, and he's dancing with the projection, then he's recording the dance with the projection, and then relaying it against itself, projecting again, so you have multiple takes of the same image. Now, if you, I'm sure some of you all have seen the Hey Ya video of Outkast, or lots yeah. of stuff, you know, where... They have intensive layers of choreography, of course. Like the Matrix was revolutionary in that when they had the fight scenes and they had copies of everyone fighting, you know, this kind of stuff. So, <coughs> Melies was a magician who wanted to apply magic technique to film. And the way he edited his films was just applying a sense of choreography to how he would do it. So, it was edited by hand with scissors. They'd have to cut it, splice it back together with tape. Well, they didn't have tape back then, but they had this kind of cellophane. Um, they'd splice it again until you had a visual rhythm that was precise. And so there's a kind of visual tempo you see going on there, visual rhythm. So this next piece I want to show is a mini history of the arrival of the idea of color in film. It's a very interesting documentary, and I'm going to let it play for about 15 minutes or so because it's really interesting. Um, I'm very interested in cinema because I think that film is our, is our basic global storytelling medium at this point. And the way film has transformed the storytelling experience, if you think of DJing, um, what the motto for most of my projects these days is DJ as director or director as DJ. So you're, you're combining streams of materials, fragments of edited points and bits and pieces and creating a seamless experience. Um, now any editor or anyone who actually does collage aesthetics knows there's a logic of association that goes on. Um, again, Sergei Eisenstein liked to call this dialectical montage. So. What you're thinking about whenever you see an image is just a stream of fragments, but we don't want to admit it. We're giving it a sense of cohesion. Um, so any editor who's ever s sat in front of a, of a film editing screen knows this, and the same thing applies with sound. But it, at the end of the day, the same thing applies to text as well, probably to architectural rendering. You're always playing with fragments until you have a seamless oh, yeah, so. structure. So perception is architecture, and we structure the world around us with how we see it, how we hear it, how we experience it. Um, 
And the arrival of color film to me is a very important dynamic, and I'll just show you um, this film for a moment. And let's. Uh, it's a great film. I'm surprised it's not more well known. It's just a, on the history of color film. Um, and it's pretty sharp. It's really well done. All right, so. So that's kind of a visual sampling. You see what they're saying? They're cutting out <coughs> material, much in the same way that Méliès had earlier done these edits by hand. But you can see in the evolution of a very short amount of time how people were beginning to start thinking about dimensionality, about standardizing a work production process. You can see a kind of a factory mode beginning to take place in the social form of how film was being made. But above all, um, most of these were applicable to choreography. And what's fascinating with that is this idea of f breaking the frame into these small components that could then be colored. Um, I'm, I find it really compelling as a beginning of thinking about sampling visually versus sampling audio. You know, so I'll, I'll like the mm -hmm. silk screen process. It's, it's all mass production mm -hmm. of an image and, figure, and running it through different color processes in the same way as post <coughs> Right, and you got to remember at this time, uh, there was the, all the movements of Impressionism, you know, you know all the different um, forms of paint that were, people were trying to figure out, Monet, Manet, all those guys, that these paintings now sell for millions of dollars. They were trying to figure out a blurry vision that was approximate to some of the early cinema. Some, some people could argue that. Some art historians would burst into flames if I said that. But um, there's other art historians, like if you see Marcel Duchamp's New Descending of Stairs, he said it was like because he was watching stop motion photography mm -hmm. and being able to break the motion into small fragments. So um, if you ever see hip hop break dancing, they're kind of playing with this idea as well of like breaking the motion to small component elements. So component elements become sequenced. The sequence becomes a cinematic experience. But above all, you can begin to see a parallel with you know, moving out of this idea of hand done material into the realm of the machinic vision. We still kind of do this with rotoscoping whenever you have films and you take the clips and you have your little dots and then as you go from frame to frame you're adjusting the dots and mm -hmm. coming out that image. So yeah, and absolutely. we do it with Photoshop all the time too when we're layering different images together. That's exa I was just about to so twenty Photoshop last year had its twentieth anniversary, which is kind of wild that it's been around for twenty years. And they I have used it beta one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, but it's, what's funny is they had a series of parties where they had erasure parties where to see who could erase people from the frame of uh, photographs more cleverly at the party. Um, and there's other events like Petra Kutra in New York and London and Tokyo that are these kinds of digital... Cut and paste. Yeah, cut, uh, cut and paste is, I think the first one was like seven years ago. Yeah. It's a, it's a party, everyone drinks and you have three people on stage doing Photoshop tricks or illustrated tricks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you get like a small question. <laughs> yeah, 15 minutes to do it. They do the most wicked, tricked out kind of skills with, with different types of programs. And you, you're drinking and talking, there's music playing, and then you judge which one you like at the end. But it's a it's great kind of learning atmosphere. It's actually, we're thinking about doing that in the architecture school. Mm -hmm. So right now, it's, you know, there's a slave master with a whip that you sit at a desk <laughs> all day. There's nothing fun about it. But this is still a kind of early cut and paste. I mean, if you think it, about it. It is cut and paste. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't actually understand, and I probably, you don't probably know either, but they didn't quite explain how it's saving time by cutting out all the different elements each time, creating a jig, and then you can overlay it with an individual color, as opposed to just hand coloring in each cell. So you still have to hand cut out every single frame as unique. Unless I'm, you know, I think what they did was then copy it and project it or something like that. But I, you're right, I'm not precisely sure. They could use it over and over again. Yeah. Use. But the body moves, so you can only use it. No, no, but the stencil. The stencil. It's, it's, it's like making a stencil. On every print. But the stencil <coughs> is different for every print. No, no, they just, they have the same black and white thing, but once they have that stencil, they can just copy it. And I know, but the thing. body is on the right side, it moves to the left side, so how can you no, use it? Okay. Well, no, okay. What I'm saying, I'm saying is that... So you have to have 20 stencils for each, for each 20 seconds or something like that. No, 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 hold on. What, what he's saying is that they cut out, it's like, if I had a piece of cardboard, and I cut out a triangle, Every time I put that cardboard against something and I spray painted yellow, it would be the same triangle. So what you're, what you're saying? I get it. But that's if it's a constant triangle. The body, these bodies are not always a triangle. They, they made a stencil for the whole film, and then would project that against the black and white. I, I get it. It's yeah. like a lot of work. 
But that's why they had like 15 to 20 women, you know. Women were the machinery of this kind of era, you know. And it's eerie because women and the idea of machinic processes, there's a whole system of the idea of the sewing factory, the early, you know, the, the women were also the first teleoperators, if you ever, you know, like this is kind of machinic process that men at the time really separated work processes by sexuality. This is, you know, if you think about the production line, um, it's kind of a compelling, interesting view of looking at the beginnings of machine processes of why women would be assigned certain roles, um, and especially in mass production. Um, just a little footnote there. So, these look like paintings, and they are paintings in a certain sense. And what I'm going to do is play a little bit more of this, and I'm going to play you a project that I did um, with D.W. Griffith's estate um, called B Birth of a Nation from 1915. But does anybody have any comments, questions? I know you're into film. Um, do you, any observations? Yeah, it's super interesting to like learn the coloring process because now it's like you know so digital and just like, but it's still frame by frame. Yeah, no. So it's, yeah. And what's interesting is the way with Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, and various non-linear editing processes we can now really start thinking about the components of the pixel, you know, like painting by pixel and looking at dimensionalizing these kinds of materials. And of course, now the, the arrival of 3D as a mass production thing. Huh? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the same thing. It's like 3D, the early states of 3D now. It's like a whoopty shit technology. We want it to be really 3D, if not fully holographic, but we're still, we're still not sophisticated enough to get it. You know? So this is, this is the same kind of uh, routine mm -hmm. to eventually But what's beautiful about a lot of this in the same context we were just talking about is when you think about storytelling, um, Birth of a Nation was the DNA of American cinema. Uh, D.W. Griffith um, did this whole situation around racial politics. An African American gets elected to the highest state of office and the white people start going crazy. It's like Obama versus the Tea Party, you know? Um, so what's amusing about this film, Birth of a Nation, is that he was highly innovative with his techniques, focused on storytelling and racial propaganda, but above all, created an uneasy tension about race and sexuality that is still mirrored in most films. Say, for example, if you look at Jar Jar Binks and um, George Lucas, if you look at um, the way black characters are portrayed in a lot of films, people of color in general, Birth of a Nation is still the DNA for a lot of that. Um, what's eerie is that um, many I'm directors... Sure Jar Jar is black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's twisted because there's a lot of layers of paradox going on because The Minstrel Show, for example, was America's first real pop culture, and that's, of course, the DNA of, of what we now consider rock, hip-hop, and, of course, techno and all the electronic music. So, Minstrel Show was whites in blackface, uh, pertain pertaining to be other ethnic groups, and they, if there was a yellow person or an Arab or whatever, you know, they would just kind of do these kinds of, like, eerie tinting, in the same way that you're talking about colorizing a film, tinting the face. You know, it's like in certain cultures, men were only allowed to play the roles of uh, women, for example, and they'd have to get dressed up. In a lot of Asian film, um, theater, women were not allowed to be actors, for example, in Japan and, and um, certain parts of China. So um, I'll let this play for a couple more minutes, and we're going to switch over to D.W. Griffith, and we're going to switch over to kind of a little bit back and forth between hopefully me and Mitch about some of these issues of compositional strategy as a kind of, I think, a good connectivity between... So you, you guys follow me here, I'm looking at editing, looking at the idea of how you choose sequences of images, and then above all, the modern notion of storytelling, what Heidegger would call the gestell, the frame. Uh, so when I was talking about the Anthropocene, imagine applying this idea of a cinematic experience. Again, we're calling this in e economic terms the, uh, the experience economy uh, of the 21st century, uh, sort of YouTube of the mind, so to speak, where everyone is updating, documenting, creating a cinematic experience, whether it be through networks of affiliation and uploading, downloading, or sending Twitter, twit pics, whatever, we're still inheritors of this kind of early machinic processes, so. Uh, isn't it interesting how much dance was such a core part of early film in the West, but now it's in Bollywood and in Arab, you know, if you go to the Egyptian cinema and so on, but dancing and like group aesthetic and movement and choreography, it was, <coughs> it was really a core part of storytelling. So um, I'm just kind of highlighting this. But um, do you guys want to watch this a little more or we can switch over to, I like the idea of just a little feedback or. I think the dance 
in these films is a spectacle. You know, it's, a chance, it's taking the stage, the, the presidium stage, in fact, and putting it on, on, on celluloid. So it makes sense to me that they would be choosing um, what we would go to a theater to see, but putting it on location in some cases. Mm -hmm. But still the same uh, vocabulary in a way, which is you want to see people perform. Um, and also because they were silent um, and played with music, it also makes sense that that, that would be the choice. Yeah, usually there was a live accompaniment, usually someone playing piano or a small string ensemble. So what you're seeing here is um, an evolution of what now, of course, we have the soundtrack, we have all this kind of digital interventions. But Wagner was the guy who really championed a lot of this idea of the Gesamtkunst work. And there was a philosophical underpinning to it because of his, his relationship to Nietzsche. And the, um, Wagner had uh, the Bayreuth uh, Opera House, which is a major uh, architectural monument. He, he was one of the first composers to be an architect at the same time, controlling the lighting, the theatricality. Um, every character was given motifs and elements. So if you went to go see you know, the Ring Cycle, like if you hear Siegfried or if you hear Flight of the Valkyries, you know, dun, 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 dun. So what I'm going to do is swap out from this and show you guys an amusing thing because Griffith was a huge Wagner fan. And um, what he wanted to do was take the update of that and make it become the soundtrack to um, Birth of a Nation as well. So you, know, you can see here really quickly. The whole, the whole soundtrack to Birth of a Nation was based on Wagner. And um, in 1915, Wagner, they would have small orchestras in front of the silent film and Birth of a Nation really set the tone for how people thought of um, kind of the cinematic experience. It was meant to be immersive, it was meant to be epic, and it was meant to be a kind of radical departure from the world around you. So when you went to go see G.W. Griffith, there's a term that was invented just because of the spectacle of his films. They called it blockbuster films because people would line up around the block to see it. Uh, Birth of a Nation was the first film to, cr to make over a million dollars um, which was a huge amount of money back then, but it was also hyper-controversial uh, because of the racial politics. Um, I'll just play you the most, one of the most famous scenes, Ride of the Klansmen. You'll, you'll know this immediately. <laughs> so um, when I presented this film at MoMA, what ended up happening was we got a whole bunch of different people to come out. It was really interesting. It was a kind of, um, just uh, for lack of a better word, just a really intriguing uh, situation because MoMA, um, Griffith had left his estate to MoMA and he had also left the other half of the estate to Harvard. And uh, because of the racial politics of the film and so on, it was just considered a very heavy, quirky situation. So um, what I'm trying to figure out is this idea of open source cinema because the film itself is from 1915 and it's in the public domain. And since that project, I've done a whole series of film rescores, um, some of Korean and Asian cinema. Um, I'm a judge for the New York Asian Film Festival. Say, for example, Madame Freedom from 1954 is a very famous film uh, for the Korean scene. Uh, then I've worked with Soviet cinematographers, uh, estate uh, Ziga Vertov, and we had that premiere at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Um, then I had a big project with Jean Cocteau's estate at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, each of these has trailers and bits and pieces, but I'm very interested in the origins of cinema and again this idea of dialectical montage, uh, looking at sampling as an art form that bridges between sound and image. Um, so Cocteau is a huge influence on my work, but above all, um, some, some of these projects are looking at this idea of interdisciplinarity, the architecture of perception, but above all, how we play with memory through sampling. So um, there's a lot more bits and pieces to this, uh, but I'm gonna swap over for a second um, to another slightly different idea of visuality, and that's gonna be graphic design. Now, I've been working with Green Patriot Posters Project, and uh, me and Chef Barry and a couple other people put together that book I showed you guys earlier. Um, thinking about cinema in a way that it can kind of define uh, and actually enhance and, and or in frame experience, um, I decided to do, embark on a series of projects looking at environmental issues. So uh, me and the Green, Green Patriot guys got together and did a book project where we put out an open call for posters on recycled paper um, showing um, how you could use graphic design to re-envision progressive issues in environmental you know, kind of movement. So we had over 10,000 uh, submissions. People made posters. 
appropriating early kind of quirky themes and you know just it was huge uh, it was an online thing <coughs> and you could just see like kind of quirky yeah Nigerian oil crisis um, so on and so on and we couldn't put as many posters as we would in the book so we just put most of them online and many of them are available for free download um, now another project that I just did about graphic design as well that I want to show you guys is um, this relates to um, this idea of music and influences. So I'll just wrap with that and then let's swap over to you and we'll just do a little bit more of a... So hopefully what I've been showing you guys is this idea of network and music effects. Uh, what happens when you start to think about layers of influence, layers of radical appropriation. So this is a map that was done by The Guardian UK and it's a map of music influences. And you can kind of see, um, I'm here in the middle between DJ Shadow, John Cage, and Lamont Young, and Kanye West, David Bowie. This is, so they did a reader's survey of the most influential musicians of the 20th and early 20th century as a subway map. And I, I kind of enjoy the idea that everybody is given, I mean, it's pretty broad, but the readers turned Nirvana in. Nirvana's a dead end. <laughs> Which one? Nirvana is a dead end. Uh, well, so yeah. so the 90s grunge movement. Um, Where's the Foo Fighters? They're on there. They no, they're here. Uh, after Nirvana? The, I think they got swapped over to like pop alternative rock. Yeah. Um, Sorry, joke. Well, they're here. Okay. So you can see the direct line of hip hop and Dr. Dre is an intersection over to Outkast and Velvet Underground. My, one of my primary competitors in a, in a fun and healthy way is DJ Shadow. We, we don't necessarily go on the great, but. Uh, <laughs> Other competitors like DJ Crush is more of a friend, and so on and so on. So I'm on the line between Pierre Boulez, John Cage, and Martin Young. Is that a De La Soul? Yeah, and the, then you transfer up to RZA and the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, this is a free graphic design uh, print that I have on my website as well. I, I sent you the link for that. So it's a PDF file of the idea of music influences, and the, the Guardian UK is one of the more influential newspapers in the UK, and this is the, the response to their... Um, readership of um, the idea of music influences and networks. So, um, I love it that it's not chronological at all either. It is just, it is, everyone is smooshed together in terms of, of uh, oh, I, I just say this, people's response to it, not just when it was made, when your work was made popular. Yeah, well, it's interesting because a lot of it's about survey. And they asked their readership online to, to vote on the most influential musicians that they experienced. Oh, so it is and from the moment of time, even though it works. Yeah, this, the they survey work. went out. Uh, it, but <coughs> I can't necessarily say how they defined it over time because it's, it's, it's a subway map, which is not necessarily unfolding in time, but it's more about layers connected to each other. So you can usually have a chart that will say, influence between 1990 to 2000 and that would show you a time unfolding chart or you know something but this is more of a not as dimensional as that um, so to make a long story short with the rebirth of a nation project um, what, what I ended up doing was having it play in a lot of radically different places um, one of the, my favorite was the uh, we got the Greek government to give me the Acropolis for an evening and I'll show you that because uh, it was really a pleasure and uh, we projected the film throughout the ruins. Now, cinema is about, to me at least, certain kinds of recording and transients. So we set up a huge sound system in the theater hall. You can see those are huge bass speakers put in the ruins. And you can see that's a person down there. So it's this, we had about 5,000 people come to the show. And um, of course, this is hip hop, so that's how we do it. But uh, oh, that's me that I have here. <laughs> uh, it's in like Spin Magazine. Um, but the Acropolis is one of those sort of temples that represents a kind of permanence, a kind of sense of transcendent time. And the temple and the theater, um, I use that as the origins of going back to the origins of what I think Wagner was trying to look for in the 19th century with the German Romanticist movement. So going to temple ruins, looking out over mountain peaks, those kind of things inspired early modernism. Uh, Shelley, you know, Frankenstein. But amusingly enough, Frankenstein ends in the Arctic North Circle. Do you remember the scene in Frankenstein? Anybody in their English lit major? Where the creature is on a flow of ice and jumps in the elf and says, damn you for making me and fuck you and I'm out of here. 
and jumps on a huge glacier that's floating on the ocean and drifts away into the North Pole. Um, so I chuckle over those kinds of resonances because when I was in the North Pole and when I was in Antarctica, this is, it's kind of funny, that I, one of the first things we discovered were these Chinese monuments to the first Chinese Arctic explorers, uh, Antarctic explorers. So these are just huge escapes of ice. And I was thinking about how the modernists were working with um, landscape, you know. So <coughs> whenever I look at a project, I do research. It's about going there. It's not about quoting it. It's about making an acoustic portrait of it. Um, so hopefully between D.W. Griffith, between the Antarctica project, and between some of the other issues, NARU, looking at economics, you can see as an artist, I'm a practitioner of sampling, whereas Mitch is dealing with this kind of I think it'd be some academic tension between design and architecture, but the connection between us is compositional strategy. That's that's my only kind of theory. Yeah, I kind of like that summation. All right, so and I was here. actually trying to find this. Can I get the uh, yep. just really quick. Every time you mentioned Frankenstein, I saw this new lecture on Frankenstein, <laughs> which was an uh, interpretation of nature and uh, artificial nature versus. Of, and there's this virginal little girl in this kind of gorgeous landscape talking to the monster uh, Frankenstein. And, and, uh, and what's, I mean, you have to see the image because it's, it's rather delightful as a little girl's offering Frankenstein flowers. And what happens in the next scene in the movie is that Frankenstein is very upset about the flower and grabs her blindly and throws her into the lake, drowning her. But of course, this is the, the <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it's really just unbelievable. You can see this in film today. Oh, Daisy, uh, oh. Oh, is that, is that sent there's some background on it? Well, on Daisy, Daisy was that weird TV ad where it's like a wood girl counting down. Oh, yeah. And then it's a nuclear explosion. Do you remember? It's uh, a famous ad yeah, from the yeah. Cold War. Yeah, yeah. That's the same girl? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a <laughs> That's bizarre, but that was a very famous ad. <coughs> Actually, I think uh, what I wanted to do is do some do some kind of exercises. But I think we're out of time for today. Maybe. Yeah, we're. Is that is the next? I think the next part is there's there's some work involved, so I don't think we can gloss over. bottom line is that there is, a, there is an endless crossover in, in disciplines now. And I think that the, the kind of fascinating thing for me is this, the way a, quote, DJ as a, as a profession just easily mixes and samples things is certainly what architects do. And now, I guess through the computational tools, the composition becomes so easy because that, that threshold is controlled by many simple sliders. And you move from all different gradients almost instantly. Though the end fact is that the product is not necessarily something that is still spotable or changing. It is, it is a, a kind of a, a building. But uh, you know, as I was showing, we, work we do is you know, buildings are just one of many things. OK, what are you guys thinking? Any, any last comments before we move into the direction? <laughs> Play tennis? That's Well, um, th that's where conversations help people digest. I mean, I'd love to have a freewheeling response. I mean, you guys have been showing the history of color film and the idea of painting onto celluloid versus the original editing techniques of hand by hand versus architecture and design of urban landscapes. You know, these are, it's a lot of collage material to digest. What is that? I, yeah, I, I mean, again, this is a longer conversation. We should pick it up on tomorrow. But there is, uh, amongst <laughs> all these kinds of factors in the <coughs> interface of the city, there is the autobiographical interpretation. And I, I, you know, as, as a professor at NYU, I have to sit in and observe other the kind of adjunct or the younger faculty. I had a chance recently to, to uh, uh, check out a course on video games. And it was unbelievable, the terminology that I was hearing. And then afterwards, I realized how incredibly relevant it is. But there are the 
these things called camping, or in this case, cocooning, or, uh, or footprinting that are just happening in the, in the landscape every day within cities. And this is when people simply tune out and dial up or, or link themselves into either a game or the web or a piece of music, and they're standing right in front of you as if you don't exist and everything around them does not exist. I noticed this, this kind of transformation happens, uh, well, especially happens when I left Cambridge and came back to New York, that when iPods, when the iPod first came out, there were so many people on the subway that absolutely weren't there. They were physically there, but their brains were in some other music. Wait, even in the middle of a mainstream football or a baseball game, they'll be wearing their iPod headphones? No, they have computer game uh, major leagues, so it's like a gigantic hall, like humongous, like a yeah. football field, and they're all just plugged in. And it's the bizarre, the, it's the most bizarre thing you can uh, do. Well, when you're playing massive multiplayer games like that, I mean, are they all playing the same game, or they're all playing radically different versions of the games that are like I subjective? A lot of them are playing the same game, and they're going, Industry that's generating more money than Hollywood, yeah, it's and the, and all sorts of people are, are in the same space we are, but are in another world for all <laughs> intents and purposes, mm -hmm. and that is the kind of cocooning effect that we find, especially a lot of the students that are out there. They're just if you have to wait online in the bank, disappear for, for 15 minutes into some gaming environment. So that it, it, now there's there's new new interfaces where you can do kind of uh, RPGs. Or, or other systems where you're role playing instantly, kind of like a flash mob. You find someone that buzzes your phone, that's your, you're someone you're supposed to assassinate or someone you're supposed <laughs> to whatever interface with, and immediately two people are in a game space and the rest of the world is happening around them while they are dodging bullets and doing odd things to one another. I think it's kind of a, a, a territory that I just, just begin to, to sample and set up as architectural clues, is the spaces that we are, that are we consider the here and now are, are not, especially as these become more and more uh, uh, kind of prevalent. Well, that's where cell phones are really becoming these kind of weird, interesting game portals in general, and augmented reality, uh, air, air graffiti. Um, have you guys heard of the movement called parkour? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's where you jump and move through the urban landscape, and yeah. your body is kind of, you're jumping and able to really, really navigate everything from roofs to um, stairwells. And yeah, absolutely. And this, was, this was the fantasy at MIT. Everyone went there, grew up with Dr. Spock and this device called the Tricorder, which is a handheld, massive supercomputer that gives you any kind of information about anything you encounter in the physical world. And so much of us thought of this as a kind of a fictive narrative that would never come <coughs> But the, the iPhone is certainly the beginning of just this. This is something where you can understand the chemistry of something you're staring at, talk to your friends across the globe, communicate nonstop, and it's a very, very new kind of world. It looks like the Sixth Sense you were going to show us. Yeah, the Sixth Sense is, uh, uh, who else has seen Patty Mays' Sixth Sense? What, the film? The, the no, no, no. Kind of. Well, this is, maybe we can end on this, because this yeah, is it's incredibly it's positive. Like, it's, uh, oh, yeah, she's uh, another Media Lab person when I was there, and this, this, is, a, this is a project. We'll, we'll work on redesigning the ear and also the digestive system. Is it stopped again? So, and then we just wrap up. But um, while he's doing that, does anybody else have to, I do want to encourage everybody to feel very much like we're in an informal con conversation. And that's where sometimes the best ideas really get, you know, generated just in the ebb and flow of conversation. So feel free to jump in. Don't be shy. Well, I was really, I was getting really inspired as we started to talk about more, more about uh, sound as it relates to architecture mm -hmm. and sound as it relates to space and, and modeling space, but also interacting with space. Then we sort of jumped right into film, and then I really lost my train of thought. I, I'm, I'm sure we'll go back there as um, our seminar continues. Yeah, tomorrow. I'm excited to we'll just, just get go back. there. Yeah, you know, I lost it. I was like, oh. No, no, I, 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 the, I'm going like, to, you know, I do, yeah, I do want to pull you guys into this idea of sonic landscape, and that's something right. that we're going to talk about with Pierre Schaefer, Pierre-Henri, mm -hmm. uh, R. Murray Schaefer, and collage aesthetics. Yeah. The information about anyway, I think that's, uh, that project's, I think, uh, I thought it was in 2007 it was first presented. Either way, it's a number of years old, and, 
and there's been many variations on it since. But part of part of what you're seeing here is something that's on the very cusp of, of, of existing. All of those things are off the shelf and available to kind of compose a new way we encounter not only people but certainly the space in the city, where it's very autobiographical. I don't know if she emphasized that enough, but all of your presets, all of your own concerns become your filter and you project upon all aspects of the city those interests and things light up and your ability to question or query or uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, your, your filter reasons is your own. It's a very curious version of a, of a world that is probably happening really soon. And this nonstop fantasy and obsession with Tom Cruise was a bit of a, a thing for a few years at the media line. Well, it would be, oh, sorry, it would be uh, really time consuming to figure out all your preferences. I mean, that would be an effort. Or it would be a collaborative as you go. You can't imagine meeting other people. Would it, you'd experience their preferences adapted yes. on you. As they walk away from Exactly, you. exactly. So it's <laughs> pretty soon you'd kind of pick up in that suit and, and kind of find out what peas or carrots turn you on or not. They could have a kind of version of it like Google does. Whenever you start it's typing in stuff, it starts showing you all the preferences of things that you might like so as well. So it so might, yeah, yourself. just build in on I remember showing my students that in media literacy class, and they panicked when they saw that all these words were going to show up about them. And I said, well, it's not just automatically generated. These are things that you've already put out there that people can see. But let's just say they don't put the best stuff out there about themselves. Yeah, like well, data, data mining is also a corporate thing as well, and your data is valuable. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening with this, and I, this is the dark side of that, is that There's you, a lot of dark side. Yeah, you just kind of like become <coughs> a walking surveillance camera on yourself. Oh, yeah. And you can easily hack iPhones and turn cameras on remotely. You can also turn the, the loudspeaker on the phone remotely for industrial espionage, which is done quite frequently, actually. actually. It, yeah, you can do a lot of stuff. So your phone, I have friends who are interested in this long story, but um, yeah, it's, most of this stuff is pretty easily hackable. And but, but this is collapsing the datascapes that I think uh, uh, Paul's talking about and the interface with the city clearly through this particular device. And, and it's a very convincing argument. The idea is to, to be first knowledgeable about these tools and then empower yourself to prefigure scenarios that would uh, be to your best advantage and kind of weed out the negative potential terms. I mean, certainly this would make for an incredible police state. Cops could just walk by and say, you know, arrested 92. Yeah. Well, they're having problems with um, psychological testing of prisoners that they've um, implemented and organizing. If someone was going to, if they could Yeah. Well, they should give it to Bush, man. I mean, it's like, you know. Yeah, there's a, there's a new book out by John Monson on the psychopath test. It's been getting a lot of coverage. Oh, but really? they use that. Yeah, there's actually a pretty good um, radio program that plays talking about the history of it. Oh, um, recently. Well, they did no, the I same. He was like really <coughs> a sweet guy, so I remembered him specifically. But yeah, this guy played it, and they didn't use it, and now they use it, and now it's keeping people in prison. I mean, in all this the discussion of like California's prisons like completely imploding and exploding themselves and What's twisted about it that is that the, the double standard of prioritization and there's a lot of layers to that because it's it's a for profit system that keeps people in prison precisely because it's it makes them money. Meanwhile the prison population, the Supreme Court just had a big ruling saying that people need to be released because most of them are on misdemeanors and so on. So say for example if you smoke a rock of crack, statistically speaking as a poor person, you're going to serve more time than a rich person, like an executive who does coke, you know. And on top of that, like the st the, the statistical layers of racial politics and the the, mil the military prison industrial complex, it, they make more money putting you away than getting you out. Mm -hmm. So it's just like and there's entire small town economies now that are tied to the prison industrial complex, you know. But um, so we're past our time, and I want to just say um, again. If there's any concerns, questions, or anything, I sent an email around just a little bit a while ago, and I see C. Mitchell. Feel free to drop a line. Uh, we're here for this class, so uh, I do want you to feel like I'm the artist and he's this kind of uh, theoretician, although I'm a theoretician as well, but we, we, we're kind of trying to get a good equilibrium between the arts and the theory, so feel free to